Hello everyone, thank you for joining and welcome to our webinar discussion, preparing for distributed workforce compliance in 2021. How technology can help your travel and remote work programs comply with posted worker and other cross-border regulations. There will be a Q&A towards the end of the session. If you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We are super excited to be joined by our guest speakers, Cindy Hillier from Newland Chase and Marcel DeWitt from BCD Travel. Cindy is Vice President of Global Service Delivery and Operations at Newland Chase, skilled in transformational change, driving operational delivery excellence and optimizing customer experience across all global mobility functions and services, including travel services. Cindy has also worked on key project deliverables for the Posted Workers Directive and Brexit Contingency Planning. Marcel is Vice President and of Tax and Treasury at BCD Travel. With over 20 years experience in indirect taxation, Marcel has a detailed knowledge of the complexity BCD Travel customers have to deal with. Marcel works closely with customers, suppliers and internal stakeholders to set up the most efficient processes for customers from an invoicing, tax, payment and compliance perspective. This is all realized by making use of the right combination of partnerships, simplicity and innovation in order to help people and companies travel smart and achieve more. We also have Topia's own Nishant Mattel. Nishant is the Senior Vice President of Topia's business travel solution Topia Compass, responsible for strategy and growth. Nishant joined Topia as part of its acquisition of Mineo, a technology company he co-founded and led. Nishant brings extensive experience in business travel analytics and change management from working with Fortune 500 companies. So before I hand over to our speakers, we would like to start with a poll question. Which of the following cross-border compliance issues keeps you up at night? Uh, answer one is permanent establishment risk, posted workers, multi-jurisdiction withholding, remote workers, or all of the above. So I'm just going to give you a few more seconds to answer those. Okay, perfect. I will share the results with you. So all of the above is uh, the highest percentage there at 38 uh, percent, closely followed by remote workers and permanent establishment risk. Perfect. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I will hand over to our speakers. Holly. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Marcel, Cindy. Really excited to have you join me this, this morning, this afternoon. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, really excited to talk to you about some of the changes that you are seeing in the marketplace from your perspective, given all the different things that have been happening over the past year, and that's a lot. Uh, in order to set up our conversation, uh, what I'm going to do uh, for the audience here, we're gonna split this session into three parts. Uh, I'm gonna take about five minutes just to lay some context as to the conversation that we're gonna be having with Marcel and Cindy. I promise not too many slides, but just to get everybody on the same page as to what is it that we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna spend a bulk of our time talking to Marcel and Cindy, who obviously given both their industry experience as well as their experience now as advisors to many of your companies and certainly companies around the world, what are they seeing? What are the trends that they're watching and what are some of the takeaways that exist for them? And then lastly, we'll open it up to you, the audience, because we are here really to answer questions that you have, things that are top of mind for you folks. So please don't hesitate. There is a chat function that is available to all of you. Uh, don't, don't, don't hold back, don't be shy. Send as many questions and we will do our best to cover as many of them as possible. To set up this conversation, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened in the last 12 months a number of things that have been in works for a really, really long time, but really have come to a head all at the same time. And when I think about 
um, you know, the different trends that are out there in the marketplace. And if somebody said, hey, pick the three biggest trends that you are seeing out there that is impacting the everyday life of HR and finance departments in organizations across the world, then I'd say there are three big trends. The first, which is not surprising, is this whole trend around remote and distributed workers. And I think at this point, you know, maybe this is something that was a new thing about a year ago, but at this point in time, like everybody has, has, has at least had to answer questions, deal with it, or at least is having extensive conversations internally about what is this going to mean for the world uh, that is going to be left behind by COVID. So that's trend one. Uh, this is a, a sentiment and this is a trend that we believe is here to stay. Uh, on a number of surveys that we have conducted, and I know that BCD has conducted, Newland Chase has conducted, we're basically seeing the same trend, which is that even after COVID, it's not that remote work is going to go away. In fact, a uh, number of studies show that at least half the employees are going to be working some part of their time no longer being in the place that you expected them to be, which is their office. And so a number of people who are not going to be in the office as you originally expected them to be are going to be working from somewhere else. It may be their home, which is in the same state, same country, or literally could be anywhere around the world. And I'm sure you have tons of those examples in your own organizations. So that's one. As a part of that trend will also be travel. Yes, travel is not happening quite to the same extent that it was happening maybe 18 months ago. But at some point in time in the next, you know, 12, 18 months, and we'll ask Marcel for his input on this, because, you know, obviously at BCD, they see a lot of this with a lot of clients, but people, uh, but BCD and, and generally companies do expect that travel will pick up at some point in the future. So what does all of this mean? So if you dial back 18 months ago, majority of the population in your organizations was basically in the place that you expected them to be, which is the office that you had assigned them to be in. And the proportion of people who are not at their desks or not in the place that you expected them to be was only about, call it five to 8% at best across industries. Obviously keeping some uh, industries like consulting apart, which, you know, uh, which, which is quite a unique case. But for most industries, I'd say it is under 8% of, of employees would be, you don't know where they are. Fast forward to today and in the future that is to come, majority of the employees will likely not be where you expect them to be. So that is a dramatic shift in terms of the compliance posture that you can now take with respect to people who are no longer in their home jurisdiction. Okay, so that's trend one. The second trend is really around posted workers. So posted workers is not a new thing. It's been around for a number of years. Conversations have been happening a lot, but then obviously suddenly in the middle of pandemic last year, law started to get uh, more finalized and it's all now coming to a head now. So even though travel is not happening and so people may not be crossing borders between EU member states, but that will pick up at some point in time and the consequences of not being compliant with postal workers are quite severe. I think Cindy has a lot of experience with this. She's done a lot of work with this, both on the industry side, but also now as part of Newland Chase. And so we'll, we'll be asking her a lot of questions around postal workers and the impact of that. So that's trend number two. And the third trend, which obviously as if uh, the COVID was not enough, postal workers was not enough, Brexit hit Jan 1. And so we have now a whole thing that is happening with Brexit and obviously that complicates things quite a lot as well. Uh, a lot of compli uh, there's a lot of consequences for this, uh, for organizations who are doing business between UK and EU broadly, but there are several implications of this as it relates to people and people crossing borders. And so we'll talk about some of those implications as well, both from a visa immigration perspective, from social security perspective, et cetera. So I'd say if I had to pick my top three, uh, and I did pick my top three, those are my top three, remote workforce, posted worker, Brexit, all coming together here in 2021 to keep things exciting, uh, both for 2021 and for, uh, for the world going forward. Now, in all of this, uh, when I have conversations with Fortune 100, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, it is always perplexing to me that one of the most fundamental questions that companies should have been answering a long time ago because we all say that people are our most important asset 
Yet we never, we, I, it, it is shocking to me that most organizations do not have any, any visibility into where people are. And that has only become even more urgent today. And I'd love Marcel and, and Cindy's point of view when we get to the panel discussion here as to how they see it. But at least in the surveys that we run, uh, it is interesting that most organizations don't have visibility into where their employees are, yet employees actually feel that is totally okay for the organizations to know where they are, especially when that information is collected in a way which is private, which is respectful of uh, you know, their privacy, and is done in a manner that allows for compliance to happen. So for example, at a jurisdiction level versus necessarily knowing exactly where they are uh, from, a, from a street address perspective. So very interesting dichotomy there in terms of the employer sentiment that uh, most often says, oh, we don't wanna know, an employee segment that says that, hey, we actually are okay for em our employers to know where we are. And then finally, technology, uh, you know, this plays a very, very big role. And I think this is where the ecosystem really is coming together. And, you know, Marcel and Cindy and, and I being here is one example of that. And is one testament to that, where to solve some of these problems, these are very complex, these are multifaceted issues where no one firm, no one company really can solve this all on its own. And so the ability for various participants in the ecosystem to come together, to be able to allow for this to happen in a streamlined and a scaled manner uh, like uh, never before has become even more urgent. And that is why I welcome Marcel and Cindy. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, this afternoon, your afternoon. Um, so let's kick this off. I am um, going to ask you sort of a question that um, you know I, has been on my mind, uh, but also minds of a lot of companies that I talk to. So in early 2020, you know, COVID hit. Nobody was really prepared for it. Com uh, you know, countries were shutting borders, and it uh, forced a lot of people to work remotely. We saw a mad scramble from organizations to figure out where employees are. So, question to you. How important would you say is it for organization to have visibility into their employee footprint? And how is it different or how might it have changed from call it 12 to 18 months ago? So maybe Cindy, you can get us started here. Uh, and then Marcel, uh, I'd absolutely love for you to chime in and share your perspectives. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so from my point of view, I um, at the start of the pandemic, I was actually working on the, uh, the business side of things. So I worked for a large consulting technology and outsourcing company. And this, this was a very real problem for us in that um, we do track our people by time reporting. Um, we did track our people by time reporting. So we were aware of where people were either reporting incorrectly or where they were reporting um, a location that as far as our records uh, listed they shouldn't be at and I think because of a number of things really prior to the pandemic we um, uh, we started to recognize that people didn't understand the importance of reporting properly or the impact of tax implications of safety and security so we'd already done a lot of work at our, uh, the company that I was with to look at that and to encourage people to connect in with us. I think the pandemic though changed all of that and the focus became much more on safety and security of people as well as the legal implications of people taking independent decisions to work remotely or just travel first, think later. And I think people have a, a uh, perception that if they have a laptop they are therefore mobile and they can travel anywhere in the world and set up and that's not a problem. So I think education, education of our HR teams in terms of what is permissible and then setting a mindset that says always check, always check if you are able to travel and if you are able to work. So taking a cautious position. Um, and I think we'll continue to see that throughout 2021. I do think travel will come back. I do think assignments will come back. But I think business will expect us to be more flexible in terms of what those assignments look like, given what's happened during the pandemic. Yeah, Cindy, and I can uh, I can jump in on that as well um, from our perspective uh, because I think as well it is 
quite important uh, to see what is actually happening. Um, uh, from our uh, perspective, um, our uh, TMC perspective, yeah, our customers, they were always very, very interested uh, where their, <clears throat> where their uh, travelers actually are. But that was always more focused yeah, from a uh, travel risk uh, perspective. Uh, so when we had a uh, natural disaster, terroristic attack or whatever, yeah, then um, our customers, they always require and expect from us yeah, that we deliver them within a couple of hours yeah, where actually our employees of their travelers are. What you see, and that is as well from our, my own experience uh, within our organization, yeah, where we have as well a workforce uh, of more than 10,000 uh, people, yeah, was as well that we, and I was already as well very interested, yeah, where my employees and our employees now actually are, um, um, but more yeah, pre-travel yeah, yeah, rather than post-travel. Uh, so therefore, it was interesting to see as well yeah, that many of you have that same concern yeah, in relation to, um, uh, for example, permanent establishments. Uh, from a tax perspective, from my perspective, um, I was always behind, yeah, because after a year, yeah, I found out, yeah, that we crossed the number of days in certain uh, countries. What we already started with our customers and as well internally, yeah, was the, the whole discussion about employee tracking. And yes, uh, Cindy, what you already mentioned as well, um, it is always, okay, but why do you want to know? Uh, why does your employer need to know, yeah, where the employee actually is? And I think it is very important yeah, to explain and have as well that communication with, um, with your, uh, your employees yeah, that it is not up to yeah, the employer, but it is as well yeah, to, to manage and, and take care and especially take care of the duty of care of the employer, of the employee and as well uh, their, uh, their families in order to manage um, yeah, their way of traveling and make sure yeah, that uh, we do the proper or the employer will do the proper things and registrations, what they need to do. And what you currently see uh, as well with the whole pandemic is that that question is popping up more and more. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe it will as well help us in this discussion uh, due to the fact that in certain countries you will get, yeah, or they already have mandatory uh, apps in order to track employees, in order to make sure yeah, that they do not get uh, in the country with a COVID um, um, uh, um, uh, infection. What you as well see yeah, is that, and that is what will come as well, yeah, digital passports, um, healthy passports, which as well indicates, um, yeah, okay, where does that, uh, that employee, where has it been? Um, and everything needs to be uploaded as well. That is a privacy uh, item. And so overall, um, yeah, it, the, the, it evolved. Um, and at the end, I think more and more employers, yeah, and as well employees, yeah, will realize that it is as well in their benefit um, rather than that this, it is more something of an employer who tries to track or control uh, because they feel it like that as well. Yeah, they're employees. Yeah, mm -hmm. Marcel, that, you make a good point here. So, I mean, I'm, I'm curious and maybe, uh, you know, Cindy, you can, you can start on this one. You know, we all agree that this is not a new topic. This has been around for a long time, Cindy, as you pointed out. Yeah. Why, have, why do you think companies have struggled with this? And those that have been able to overcome that struggle, what have they done differently, right? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of folks in this call right now who are saying, yes, we've heard this before. We've taken this to our management, but look, it, it sort of dies on the wine, right? So, mm -hmm. so help me understand, like, why, what have you seen? Why companies struggle with this? And the ones that have successfully been able to put a program in place, what, what are they doing differently? Sure. Um, and I think it's a it's hugely complex topic. And I think if you, uh, you know, if you think about the top of the call when you were talking about the three areas of sort of focus for this year, so Brexit, the pandemic, and then posting of workers within Europe, there's three really big topics that cross over into each other. And I think the reality is if you wind the clock back maybe three years, there was um, 
some focus and interest in certainly posting of workers and tracking people and making sure that companies were compliant. I remember speaking at a forum in Germany at the time and um, uh, I did a bit of a show of hands of who felt that they were in control of their posted workers and not many people could raise their hands and say that they were. Um, for me, I think the scrutiny around the most recent changes has been much more robust and I think people are beginning to understand the ramifications of not taking it seriously, of getting the right advice and guidance in place. And so they're using professional services companies to get that advice. Um, I, I think it was one of those things historically that maybe people just thought, yeah, it's there, but nobody's really taking it as serious as it, seriously as they should, certainly prior to three years ago. So I, I just think the dynamic has changed. I think with the, the world getting smaller, with some of the behavior around, I'm going to call it a degree of protectionism about local roles, um, there is much more focus on um, making sure that people are going into countries for the right reasons rather than, rather than displacing local workforce. So I, I think there absolutely has to be the focus on it now. I think if you add the dynamic of Brexit and the dynamic of the pandemic to that, everything kind of comes together. And what we're finding from our clients is that they, they don't just want advice on one of those single things. It's kind of all being bucketed up together in terms of, okay, I need the immigration advisory. What does that mean from a pandemic point of view and keeping my people safe and then what do I need in terms of the legal implications of the posted workers? Yeah I okay. can and in addition I can mention as well that what I find out as well with uh, when discussing uh, this with uh, with our customers is as well sometimes yeah ownership yeah so who is now actually as well yeah responsible for this um, but who should as well benefit from this? So uh, most yeah. of the times there are different internal stakeholder functions, departments within an organization, with, which all have the same goal, yeah, because they need that data. Um, and that is as well how they approach us. Yeah, they need to have data where we share, uh, can tell them or share already with them yeah, that they already have that uh, the availability to that data due to the fact that their HR departments, for example, yeah, get these uh, these reports. Uh, so it, it is as well, yeah, uh, ownership, yeah, of the um, of the of the process, um, yeah, and as well, yeah, the more um, yeah, yeah, compliance and complexity it will be, yeah, because as of this moment as well. There is not that much travel, but if you travel, yeah, then the first question is, yeah, okay, yeah, how did you have set up, yeah, as of this moment, your travel policy? Yeah, did it change yeah, compared to um, a year before? And then the question is, yeah, okay, that travel policy, yeah, what does it say, for example, over COVID? Yeah? So are you actually already to, uh, able to travel yeah, based on your internal uh, policy? And then you need to uh, you didn't need to know if you need to have an, uh, a negative test, yes or no. But in addition to that, uh, that is as well what what, what Cindy uh, described and where as well their expertise is more. Yeah, you know, um, do you need to have an, uh, a visa? Do we have the posted workers um, 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 uh, filings? Uh, so it is as well yeah you know, more and more uh, to come. Um, and that is as well the discussion I have with our customers. Yeah. You know, there are so many rules around the globe, yeah, and don't think you can cover 100% of everything, yeah, but make the, uh, the analysis internally, define where your biggest risk is, yeah, and focus first yeah, on the first yeah, um, two, three uh, risk areas, yeah, and take right. it from there, because then I think you can as well yeah, create a joint effort and show yeah. internally as well the added value yeah, of the um, uh, of the the data, uh, the reportings. Um, uh, yeah, you 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 currently uh, perform. 
Mm. And I, I think to add to that, Marcel, I think there's something about, um, certainly in my prior company, there was a bit of a debate in terms of who was responsible for the posted workers directive. So is it an HR responsibility? Is it a mobility responsibility? Where do the tax and the working implications come in? And, and I think there's something there about, you know, mobility is there to absolutely administer it, but it needs the advisory from the legal and the tax position to be able to do that and so it, it, for me it's about bringing the right brains together with the right knowledge and experience to make sure that you've got the full um, the full sort of risk covered in terms of what you're dealing with to be clear about what the role of the advisory for immigration is and how often that needs to be reviewed and updated so that people are clear on it's not just one part of it that's important it's actually all of it and uh, so no one function singularly owns it I think is important. Yeah Cindy that's a very interesting point and you know from my own experience I completely agree with you I think this is one of the areas that is multidisciplinary there is no one function that can necessarily do all of it or know all of it mm -hmm. uh, but in my experience I'm curious to hear how you've seen companies who've been successful in this space deal with it is that in many cases it is because it is by committee the decisions actually don't get made and it takes forever to get everybody aligned because there is no one owner. Yeah. And so I'm just curious to hear from your perspective, you know, the companies who have been able to make it happen, you know, is there, is there are you seeing that uh, a single function then steps up and says, okay, I will take ownership. I'll be the project management office or whatever. Mm -hmm. I will, you know, I will coordinate all the different functions that need to be coordinated or is this truly a joint ownership with no one Sure. And I think it, it I think it varies based on the degree of potential risk and impact, honestly. So uh, my experience of a very large company um, where they had tried to gain traction for some time in terms of the posted workers directive, but couldn't really get anybody to take it seriously. Um, and then just by changing the language slightly in terms of risk and impact, being able to go to leadership and say, there is an issue here and it's a risk and it has to be addressed. And these are the ramifications of not following that process. So the fines, you know, the impact of people being able to travel, risk to contracts, all of those sorts of things. And so so for me, I think there are two things. You've got to have a game plan in terms of your strategy of approach and how you're going to address that as a business. Um, I do think it's beneficial to have one person leading that as a PMO that is pretty senior in the in the sort of organization, if you like, because I think there is a there's a rub, if you like, or a negotiation between what you want to deliver operationally and what your leadership is prepared to support and sign up to and certainly in my experience the most successful have come where that relationship has been bridged really well and leadership has absolutely signed up and said yeah it's a difficult decision but we will take it you have our full support please move forward and when leadership doesn't sign up to that I think it's more problematic. Yeah, yeah I totally agree <clears throat> and that is as well what we currently do as well in RFP processes yeah, for uh, new customers, yeah, um, uh, do not start only the discussion, for example, with an, an, an travel manager or a travel procurement manager, yeah, because it is much more than uh, only travel. Uh, it will have tax consequences, it does have um, um, uh, wage tax consequences, social um, uh, tax, uh, tax consequences, immigration, and whatever you name it. And what we, our experience was out of the past, yeah, uh, it is more focused on the travel, on the, the data. And as soon as they actually uh, start um, uh, the execution of the contract, then it turns out yeah, that it is not aligned with finance departments. It is not aligned with tax yeah. departments and where they, and HR departments actually, and where they have a total different view or vision and what they expect yeah, out of their travel. And so, uh, the, 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 yeah, the discussion yeah, with, the, with the customers, but as well internally, yeah, you should make it a joint effort because everyone is interested and need yeah, this data yeah, yeah. in order to make sure that it works in, an, in a proper way. 
Okay. Yeah. No, I you know, totally. And I'm picking up another thread that both of you actually mentioned separately is this piece around, um, you know, obviously there are a number of different things to potentially consider here, right? We've got things from tax perspective, things from payroll perspective, we've got the labor laws, got so many different things happening. Um, and so, you know, as I have talked to a number of companies, I've seen two approaches. Uh, there's an approach where we want to solve everything now and today. And so we're gonna take the whole thing, we're gonna try and figure out a solution for the whole thing versus, you know, we're gonna, I, uh, we're gonna identify the one or two or three things that are most important to us. We're actually gonna get that done, see the results and then build upon that. I think that's I, something I heard from you. So I think that is sage advice. Right? You start with a few things that are most important to you as an organization. My question for you is those things could look different for different organizations, right? What is most important to them based on their business, where they're based, et cetera. How have you seen companies arrive at that point of view as to what are the challenges that they should be addressing first? What would your advice be to this audience? How they, how they should identify those and build a case on that internally? Sure. Um, so from my point of view, I think you need to look for the red flags for sure. Go for the red flags first in terms of where you believe your areas of risk are. Um, be clear, that, you know, the directive is complex, it's challenging. So do seek advisory and guidance in terms of how the directive applies to you and uh, the specific areas that you need to kind of home in on in terms of protecting your business. I think that's absolutely key. Um, and, and I think while it's great to focus on the, the, the priorities, be clear that the longer term time timeline will need to be followed and that we don't just tick off those three things and then we're done. So I think it's about identify the priorities first, take advice in terms of um, navigating the directive actually because it's incredibly complex and look at where you have volumes of people going into countries um, where you may be at risk. I think start there um, and particularly where you are in risk of falling foul, foul of legal positions whether that's tax law or um, immigration law, absolutely make sure that you've got those locked down and then um, uh, sort of work through the process from there. That would be my view. Yeah, <clears throat> and I, uh, what I mentioned as well um, before, um, you need to identify based, and you can already do that yeah, on, on expense management data, on, on travel trip data from your TMC. Yeah, focus yeah, on uh, the, the, the countries yeah, uh, where you have the biggest risk. Yeah. Yeah, and then as well, first start, yeah, and that, that is really something which you need to uh, consider. Yeah, try to get control yeah, over the travel yeah, pre-trip. Uh, yeah. Because it is as well uh, my own experience. Yeah, if you work based on post uh, data, yeah, then you are always too late. And yeah, with the, the latest uh, of with all the technologies and APIs and interfaces uh, available, it is already quite easy yeah, before your traveler, before they start traveling, yeah, to identify yeah, if they go to a risk area, if they pass a certain number of, uh, of days, if they travel to a an, an, an country where it is not allowed yeah, from internal uh, travel policy perspective of, or, or whatsoever. So, so focus on that. And in addition to that, yeah, what I see, and that makes it for us, um, but as well uh, for all of us on this call as well, March, uh, so, so complex, uh, it is always about as well traveler experience. Uh, and, and the traveler experience yeah, that also indicates yeah, um, that we should not bother the traveler with <laughs> all these kinds of things. And with all these uh, the, the, uh, these compliance uh, tasks, and so yeah, as a company as well, and they very look into the fact as well. Okay, yeah, it is a given that we have these rules. It is a given that we need to follow up on these rules in order to make sure that the travelers as well will not end up in uh, in um, in any uh, any problems. Um, mm -hmm. But okay, how can you? How can we get there? Yeah. Um, yeah, without the, 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 the travelers yeah, complaining of an additional um, uh, compliance uh, burden. Yeah. 
And I think there's something certainly um, uh, because of the posting of workers, the, um, the notification and the timing of that notification is absolutely key. And so if in some markets you have a high volume of travelers, say traveling from India into um, one, of the, one of the relevant countries, there's probably something that you can do about tying some of the process at the front end of that. So hand over the visa, carry out the, um, the sort of posted workers activity at that point where you can. So be really clear about what the activity is and where you can fit it into the process, because I think very often people feel that retrospective reporting is acceptable, but in many cases for the posted workers directive, it's not. And so it's about making sure that you've got everything locked down in terms of what you're doing and when you're doing it. And that's why the guidance um, and the, the sort of consistent position is so important. Those are very wise words. Thank you for sharing that. One other aspect of this, and Marcel, this came up, uh, you know, as we were talking about this webinar, um, the question about, you know, at what point does the cost of compliance exceed the benefit of compliance? And I think you've been hearing that question a lot from your clients. I'm curious to hear sort of how are you addressing that question for your, for your clients? Yeah, so what what I um, what what I actually see that is that in Europe, yeah, you really see a transition, um, especially in the multinational by the multinational companies, yeah, the, where they actually are, are searching, yeah, to get this um, automated, yeah, as much as possible, um, rather than. Uh, and that can be an in, 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 uh, that can be partly uh, in sourcing, that can be partly uh, outsourcing, but that is as well each and every time, yeah, where our customers um, yeah, deal with, uh, because they do not want to deal with um, one party for posted workers um, um, uh, uh, filings, um, uh, one party for um, making their, uh, their travel booking, another party for doing their uh, vet reclaim, for example. Yeah, they want to have one yeah, um, point of contact, one single uh, process, yeah, again, um, against one price. And if you really look at the current situation, yeah, and then we all can agree and we already know yeah, that it is a quiet, uh, a complex and uh, a compliance burden yeah, to, get, um, uh, to get this done. Uh, so, yeah, and therefore, in order to make sure that the price yeah, will go down, yeah, we advise to our uh, customers um, to automate as much as possible but as well, yeah, have a look, yeah, how you already can, for example, involve your uh, dedicated agents in this whole process. Yeah? Because most of our multinational uh, clients, they are fully dedicated uh, travel agents um, who are actually doing the bookings. But as well, yeah, look how you already, um, of how you can make use of them as well, because so, most of the times you already pay for them. Uh, so that is our, that are the, the, the things, yeah, how we uh, currently uh, manage it. And that is new. Um, and we, as well as a company, as, an, as Base of Day Travel, we are working each and every day of, uh, on our technology to get everything more and more integrated. Yeah, and at the end, yeah, that should reduce, yeah, expense, but as well uh, uh, time, yeah, to get all this done. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Cindy, did you want to add to that? I know Newland Chase, uh, as an example, has started to you know, add other pieces like the post worker and A1 on top of immigration. So, so what is the thought process? Is it sort of similar to the direction in which Marcel is going or is there a different thought process behind it? Yeah, I think it's about recognizing that actually there are a number of services that a client might need in terms of um, uh, advisory or a clear position. So uh, absolutely, Newland Chase is working on looking at providing A1 support and um, posted worker notifications on behalf of business. So, um, and I think I've seen this evolve over time where I think historically travel 
organizations have sat very separate to mobility organizations. But I think with the, um, you know, to my prior point, the world getting smaller, increasingly those things are coming closer and closer together. So you don't look at them as separate things so much anymore because some of the um, requirements kind of cross over into both. And I think by bringing them closer together and giving a consistent advisory position, um, you can be clearer with people about how they navigate um, what they need for that particular case. That makes sense. Um, awesome. Right, I have an audience question that I'm going to ask here. Uh, Marcel, you, know, you, you can get started. This sounds like more in the travel arena. So, uh, you know, with uh, as a result of COVID, obviously there's a lot of talk about countries, organizations putting policies in place for testing, vaccinations, you know, before travel can happen. Um, where do you see all of this going in the future where, you know, countries sort of, uh, do you think this whole mandate around, you know, vaccine passports, um, you know, in countries acquiring vaccine checks, is this sort of here to stay or, what, and, you know, obviously EU has taken a point of view that this could be discriminatory in some ways. And like, there's so many different pieces here. Curious to hear from, from a BCD hat, what is your perspective? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I don't see this going away. And um, because what you the, what we currently see, that is, um, uh, for example, if we start with the uh, with the medical um, uh, passports, yeah, I think yeah that it will that is something yeah what will come. You currently already see that several um, airlines they already yeah require it. Um, the difficulty in this is that as of this moment, there are around yeah, four players yeah, who are actually working yeah, on a uh, digital medical passport. And as well, yeah, from our perspective, that is already yeah, as well um, uh, making things more and more complicated rather than that we have one. Yeah, they are actually now already with four. Right. Uh, those four, some of them, yeah, they connect uh, to the airlines. Yeah? So, for example, Delta Airlines, yeah, they already connected to one. So if you want to fly with Delta Airlines, yeah, then you need to have yeah, an, um, an, um, a medical uh, passport um, uh, later in these, in these months. But uh, if you travel uh, to China, uh, there you probably will need one as well. Yeah, but that indicates that you need to have another medical passport from another provider. And of course, yeah, that does not yeah, work, or at least it will not help. Um, the same what we will see with, um, uh, with apps. Um, in some countries, yeah, and that is in particular now Asia, I have to say that Asia is a bit more um, uh, further uh, than, um, than uh, Europe and, uh, and Americas. Uh, yeah, there as well for incoming, yeah, they, you will be required yeah, to have that app yeah, in order to track. And if you need to be in quarantine, yeah, so they can track yeah, actually um, where you are. That also indicates yeah, with the testing, um, we as well, yeah, as, as, an, as, as base of day travel, yeah, we are currently as well investigating yeah, um, if we as well can offer uh, tests yeah, because um, in the coming months and you want to fly in the minimum, yeah, what you need to uh, provide, yeah, that, that will be an, an, a negative test. Yeah, and of course, then the question is, okay, um, how accurate should the test will be? Uh, you probably as well need to have a test when you uh, fly back. Uh, so, yeah, and I think yeah, this will be really yeah, an, 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 an game changer. Um, and yeah, we as well hated to have some delays <laughs> or needed to wait. Um, but I think, yeah, this as well can become something where you could think, okay, negative test, medical uh, passports, where um, my vaccination will be, uh, a certified vaccination will be uploaded. It will yeah, bring um, a lot of more hassle yeah, the coming years. Uh, most likely over two years, uh, yeah, it, it is normal eh, because it is the the norm of the new way of travel, but the coming years, yes, this will be, uh, this will be uh, hard. That's mm. good. Thank you, Marcel. Cindy, I have one that's coming from Trish, uh, that's, you know, likely in your wheelhouse. So Trish and her organization, they put together, uh, you know, post-worker process and tools and resources. 
But uh, what uh, you know, she and the company seem to be struggling with is to how where where can they go? Is there a centralized place where they can go and find the rules for the countries across EU? Right now, it seems like you have yeah. to go to different places for different processes and registering and all of that other stuff. So yeah. in maybe thirty seconds because I have a yeah. question from another participant that I do want to share with the rest of the group here. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a really tricky one. And um, so certainly in my prior role, I had to commission a piece of work, actually, because I wanted to see all of the country data in one place. Um, and uh, that was a piece of work that at the time a legal firm helped me with, which was my point of reference. I think the challenge at the moment is that advice is still sort of evolving and settling. Um, so I I do have a link to a website which I'll share um, post the call so that can be circulated out with the notes that uh, will be a useful point of reference but my guide would be circumstances are changing all of the time at the moment so don't read it once and think you've got it keep going back and keep checking what's changing. Thank you. Uh, I want to close this uh, with I'm gonna, and I'm going to read this as it came in. Uh, this is from uh, from a participant I'm, I'm going to keep them anonymous but uh, I think this is a great way to end this conversation. And she, she states, quote unquote, the problem is that while HR or mobility address the risks constantly, we know that it takes an actual incident for leadership to really face things. This is unfortunate. So the hope is that COVID may help leaders listen more and make strategic decisions on who owns things and start to move on the higher priorities, as you all mentioned here. In my previous organization, they did focus on compliance as a part of culture. I, under, I underline the word culture, but this is not the case with so many other organizations. I think this is so true. And I, you know, I, I sympathize completely with, with a number of folks in the audience today have had hundreds and hundreds of these conversations where you know, HR, mobility, finance, they all wanna do the right thing but I think there is, uh, what is missing is the leadership. And I think, you know, for all the leaders on this call, this basically, this, this is a really good message to you all to think about how do you get the various pieces in your organization together to really address this very important area of compliance and to make sure that your most important asset, your people remain safe, uh, not just today, but in the world to come. With that, thank you very much all for joining. Marcel, Cindy, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Appreciate all your insights. Till next time. Thank you.